Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Blackwell, and welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Beth Halliday, a graduate student at Aleph Trust and Liverpool John Moores University in the United Kingdom. I've invited her to the podcast to talk about her master's degree research project because her topic sounds interesting and she could use a little help from our Bipolar Awakenings community. Her dissertation research is exploring the relationship between inner transformation and outer change. Is there a relationship between these two topics? And if so, what's the nature of that relationship? Beth reached out to me at Bipolar Awakenings because she thought I might get her in touch with some interesting research participants. So Beth, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Sean. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay, and so like I was saying, your topic sounds very specific, very interesting. How did you come to get interested in this subject? Basically, it comes from my own awakening experience, which happened about eight years ago. Prior to that time, I had never heard anything about consciousness studies or spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency or anything like that. So it's, it's been a, you know, one kind of following the breadcrumbs along the way to, to the point where I've arrived here. When I started at Aleph Trust, which is a graduate program in consciousness studies, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology, you know, you study all these different uh, theories and different ideas, transpersonal psychology being psychology of the self, the larger self, so beyond our personal limited selves. There's such an, a large amount of really interesting material. Okay, well, let's, let's slow Sorry. down a little bit. <laughs> Because you first started talking about your awakening, your awakening here. Uh, most of the people on this uh, podcast will have had some sort of, you know, spiritually transformative experience of, of some kind. How awakening was yours? How bipolar was it? How how did it go? Well, for you? I didn't. I can. can I can. Uh, I didn't end up in the medical system, so I didn't end up mm -hmm. with a any particular diagnosis assigned to me. My experience was started as a spiraling downward depression type of an experience, which now with the language mm -hmm. of transpersonal psychology, it would be called a dark night of the soul type of an experience. But I had right. no framework at all at that point. I had no understanding about anything like that. And I had no support, and I had no one who had any idea what was going on with me. And at, at that time, because I come from a medical background, I was a professional nurse, registered nurse when I started my career, uh, and, and my clinical description was that I had had a nervous breakdown Okay. because I didn't have any other framing okay. for it. I didn't have any other idea about what was happening with me. And um, mm -hmm. so I kind of stumbled along and... The depression got deeper and I, you know, a lot of emotional content that arises, of course, when we have these transformative types of experiences and I had no idea how to deal with it. And about, I was really fortunate because about six or eight months in, um, I made contact with an old friend who was already involved in consciousness studies. I didn't actually know that, but she was. And when I told her how I was doing, or she asked me how I was doing, and I told her, uh, because we were good enough friends that I felt like I could be kind of forthcoming with her, uh, she said, you need to come out here. She lives in California at the time. I live in Nova Scotia. Um, you need to come out here, right. and I have a teacher that I'm working with, and I will ask her if she will work with you. And... So I was very fortunate in that sense that that was the beginning of my uh, introduction to consciousness studies with a teacher in California who uh, works in a very intuitive way. She's not a mainstream practitioner at all. She doesn't use any medications. She doesn't use any uh, psychological terms. She works with hypnotherapy and she works with shamanic practices and energy medicine types of practices. So very, you know, from a Western perspective, from a Western medical perspective, which is where I had come from, these were very esoteric practices. And I was at the point where I was just like, I, it, okay, I don't understand it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate here because I don't know what else to do with myself. Right, and you're, you know, you're from the east coast of Canada, Nova Scotia. There's not a whole lot out there, is there? 
in terms of these kind of practices compared no, to the West Coast? Uh, no, California? California really is kind of an epicenter for, uh, you know, esoteric practices. They have been for 50 years mm -hmm. anyway, maybe longer than that. So what opened up with this uh, healer person or therapist? What I ended up becoming aware of was that I had, uh, not, I, not that I didn't know I had trauma because I knew I had had a, quite a, a lot of abusive situations when I was a kid, when I was a young adult, long, right. kind of long term. And I did, you know, the functional thing, which was to basically push it aside and decide how it was I was going to be successful in life and just kind of, you know, get over it, don't think about it, whatever. And so I had done that and I had done well in school and I had become professionally functional and, and, you know, relatively successful. I mean, I could support myself and was advancing in my career and that type of thing. Okay. And never gave any of that uh, historical content, that trauma content, any thought. My, my, my way of managing it was to simply say, I don't want to invest any of my energy in that because I feel like that just makes it stronger. So I'm not going to invest any of my energy in that. And probably like many other people who might be listening to this, that uh, I found out that strategy doesn't work. <laughs> and I think that's the most common strategy <laughs> is you just bury it. Right. Yeah. There's an episode of, there's an episode of F is for family, this cartoon about the seventies and the, the father tells the son after the, the son has just watched a murder of a man going through a airplane motor. It's a, it's a, it's a okay, cartoon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but he just goes, just push it down, son. Push it. Push those feelings <laughs> down. Just push them down. You know. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's kind of exactly. what you're talking about. Just filling your life with activity and professional behavior, right. and but then it comes back to. It really you, does, right? and that was one of the things I couldn't uh, initially. I couldn't understand from, uh, and I asked my teacher about many times because. I just, like I say, I've said it a couple of times already, so I'm sorry to be a repetitor, but I had no background in, I had no psychology background. I mean, nursing, you get a little bit of psychology, but it's very uh, mm -hmm. superficial on that, on this type of level. And so I just had no frame of reference and I couldn't understand why it had to all come up and all be dealt with. And she just would say to me, the old saying, you know, the only way through is through. The only way Thank out you. is there's through. The, there's the correct version, yes. Yeah. That's a groff phrase all the time because, you know, I'm a certified holotropic breathwork facilitator. And there's many times during breathwork where people will be like, make yeah. it stop. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the trainers will say, there's only one way out of this right. and it's through. So yeah. keep going. But it's, it's you know, it can so be terrifying. As you, as you or many people may know, it can just be terrifying to go through some of that. Um, mm -hmm. But it is true that that's the only way out. I worked pretty intensively for about 18 months or two years almost. Uh, Did you stay in California? No, I was, that, uh, <laughs> that was the longest commute I've ever done in my life, back and forth. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I would go out for oh, a couple of weeks and, and work pretty intensively, and then I would come back home. And then, it, you know, I needed some time to digest what it had been, what I had been processing, and then, you know, practicing all of those self care kinds of things, the grounding and getting enough sleep and getting something to eat and all those physical kinds of things that we think maybe aren't so important, but they're very important because the physical body is what's allowing us to do this transformative psychological and emotional and energetic process that we're involved in. It's very mm -hmm. demanding. Mm -hmm. So that that's your experience there, and then that leads you into your education? Well, not directly. I ended up uh, doing consciousness studies at the school in California, which is called the Foundation of the Sacred Stream, and becoming a okay. what they call uh, the modality that's taught there is called depth hypnosis, D-E-P-T-H, depth hypnosis. Okay. And it's a very supportive, transformative, psychological, spiritual counseling model. So it uses the practices that I was introduced to when I was being cared for, being supported through my own transformation. And so I became a practitioner okay. and I opened a private, I have a private practice that I maintain in 
uh, working with clients, and no surprise, many of my clients come in with histories of trauma. So you're sort of the wounded healer. That's the that's one of the archetypes. Yes. <laughs> and so then from there, you're so after a few years in my practice of depth hypnosis mm-hmm. and working with people, um, I had this. Mm-hmm. I use this term cognitive dissonance, which is this. I don't know if everybody understands that that phrasing or not, but it's the idea that our minds can't make sense of something. We, we're seeing something, but then there's part of our brain that's saying, well, that can't be real, or that doesn't make any sense, or I don't know how to understand this. And what I, what I found was I have this cognitive dissonance between the part of myself that was educated in Western medicine and worked in nursing and worked in acute care and you know worked within this framework of you know, kind of a biomechanical approach to well-being or to health. Actually, it's a biomechanical mm-hmm. approach to illness in the Western medicine, but there's not a whole lot of focus on health necessarily. So I, but I had right. that. It's focused on yeah, illness. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illness model, not exactly a wellness model. Exactly, my point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so, but I had that whole framework and it's a scientific framework and I was educated in it and I practiced it for a number of years and I was very comfortable with it. And then I had this whole other experiential side of my life that had kind of made itself present to me. And I couldn't figure out how those two things worked together. I know they worked for me. Mm. You know, I mean, here I am, I have this education and I have this experience and, and I'm functional. I am. I trust you. <laughs> um, I promise you. <laughs> but I couldn't, I, I found that I had difficulty I don't have difficulty working with my clients, but if somebody wanted me to give them an explanation of the type of work that I did or why they might be interested in the type of work I did or how it might be beneficial to them, I found that I had a hard time kind of melding these two different approaches. Were you looking for like a rational explanation to to describe your esoteric practice? I was looking for a way. Why do you think there was a disruption? I value... Uh, the ability to speak in a way that people can understand. A lot of people have are, are highly intelligent and highly educated, but I find myself that when I try to listen to them, I may not understand what they're saying exactly, or it may not be very clear to me. They're very skilled in it, so they're talking about it without necessarily giving me enough background to understand kind of their jumping off point. And so I felt like I completely understood, you know, the medical approach to things. And I completely experienced the experiential part of things. But esoteric practices are not so easy to explain to people. Esoteric practices many times are, you know, they're mysteries. They're mysterious. They're magical. They're ephemeral. They're all these kinds of, you know, they have all these kinds of characteristics that don't easily lend themselves to our language. Do you have one that you want to share with us? One. That you think is diff- was difficult for you to explain? I don't know. I think that one of the, one of the kind of esoteric ideas is about spirits. How do you deal with spirit? spirits? So spirits in the sense of mm-hmm. energetic beings or energetic presences, perhaps, that are outside of our own kind of understanding of ourselves, our body, our mind, our little personal energy space that's around us. Uh-huh. So spirits, like I say, like supernatural, like supernatural spirits. spirits, like foreign spirits, okay. like some kind of energetic mm-hmm. um, presence that you don't understand or you don't recognize. Mm-hmm. How do you talk about that? And I had, so that was one of the experiences that I had that was dealt with uh, through shamanic practices of what's called releasement, spirit releasement, okay. uh, which is certainly an esoteric practice. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I know that this idea, which is, which is hard to communicate, this idea of energetic presence, that's something other than your own energetic presence. Like how many of us even think about what is my right. energetic presence? I never had thought about that. Some people experience mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. I've, I mean, you know, in, 
in the years that have elapsed since my own experience, I find that lots and lots of people actually experience energetic presences separate from themselves. People hear voices, they see things, they feel things, they smell things, they feel that they've been touched or something by, you know, some other kind of energetic presence. And what do you call that? And do I even want to tell anybody about that because they'll think I'm crazy? But those experiences <laughs> of, and I'll, I'm going to just use the word energetic presence or the term energetic presence because I, it's, it's kind of an all-encompassing term, those phenomena happen all the time to many, 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 many people. But because our Western culture is so averse, to anything that does not fit within the kind of Newtonian rules of reality. You know, if you can't see it, hear it, feel it, touch it, you know, tangibly, it doesn't exist in our, in our cultural mm -hmm. approach. There are other cultures in the world who easily, readily acknowledge the fact that there are all kinds of energetic things that are happening around us all the time. So mm -hmm. it's not so unusual. And if somebody has an experience it's not so unusual. It's recognized. It's talked about. It's, you know, that's the whole, that's a piece of the whole shamanic history where, you know, the shamanic illness comes upon somebody and their community recognizes what's happening to them and supports them through it. Well, our term in Western culture for a shamanic illness is a spiritual emergency. Yeah. Yep. I think so. I think so. It certainly parallels. And I think in the, the original book from The Stormy Search for the Self by Stan Groff, I think he included shamanic illness as one type of spiritual yeah. emergency. Yes. Have you read yes, that? Yes, I have. Have you read that book? Yep. Yeah, so you, you probably saw it, yeah. It's like the Bible <laughs> of my channel to a certain degree. But I mean, Stormy yeah. Stormy Search for the Self. All right. And so um, this leads you to LF. So my my desire to be able to kind of merge those two sides, that technical side, that medical right. side, and that experiential side. I kept thinking about it and trying to, you know, meditate on it and ask for guidance and that type of thing. What am I supposed to do to resolve this? And it just kind of kept coming up that I needed a little more education. And it took me a couple of years to sort out what that meant. And if I was going to go back to school, uh, where would I go and what would I study? because I only really wanted to study about consciousness. Consciousness evolution, consciousness mm -hmm. development, and, 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 you know, just give me a framework to put these things together that I have, that I have accumulated at this point in my life. Well, it had to be an accredited university program for me, and I wanted, because my undergraduate degree is a, ba is a bachelor's of science, I wanted to have a graduate degree that was a master's of science not a master's of art. I really wanted the intersection between the mystical or the transpersonal and the tangible medical scientific side of things. I really wanted to be right at that intersection. And I wasn't confident that in an MA program, in a, in a master's of art program, that I would have, that there would be sufficient emphasis on the scientific piece of it to let me make that um, connection for myself okay that's interesting and you know reading the the research that's out there in this topic of spiritual emergency or transformative experiences and that it's extremely difficult research to do yes i mean to really get it polished in a scientific way is not easy and then when you take the disposition of the average person who has these experiences they tend to be a lot more on the artistic side. You know, we're not talking about engineers and accountants. We're talking about <laughs> artists and dancers and actors. And they tend not to be that interested in, in doing the research. And, and even if they were, once they saw what was necessary to get it actually done and published, it's a daunting cha challenge. You know, it's really tough. Well, I would just, I would have to disagree with you on one point, which is that spiritual emergence okay. or spiritual emergency is an equal opportunity employer. So it does not matter what the person does in their living, for their living. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. 
because we all, now this is my own opinion, but we all have this evolutionary journey to follow our own particular mm -hmm. evolutionary process. And the only reason that you might think that engineers and scientists and academics don't have those kinds of experiences is because the bar for them for disclosure feels even higher than the bar for most of us for disclosure, meaning that how difficult it is for us to maybe talk about what's happening to us or happening with us to somebody else because we're afraid of what they're going to think about what what's going on with us. So for most of us, that's that's difficult okay. to find somebody that we can talk to that we feel comfortable sharing what's going on. There just was a paper, Marjorie Wolcott, who does a lot of research in uh, tra in the transpersonal psychology area, just published a paper last year that was uh, a compilation of 56 or 60, I think, scientists, academics, you know, professional people who were writing and speaking about their own spiritual emergence situations and experiences that they had never disclosed because of the risk that they felt for them being censored by their own peers. Wow, that's interesting. That's that's new information for me. And I mean, I kept quiet about my situation for 10 years. When I worked in advertising, I never told right. anybody. When I went to Peru because I had a dream and it was a shamanic journey, I never took any photos. I, I just went down there and why, why am I here? You know, I didn't tell anybody at work what I was doing down there. Yep. <laughs> but then later it's like, you gotta, you gotta kind of come out right. right at some point. Well, and at yeah. some point, you know, I think that's part of our own our own progress, our own development is to have to, you know, kind of go public. All right. Yeah, and so your dissertation. Can you remind us your topic of your so the dissertation, dissertation is about? It has a long kind of technical name to it, but it is a looking at or exploring whether or not there is a relationship between inner transformation the personal kinds of changes that we go through, and external change in how we engage in the world. So in a kind of a simpler way, um, and to apply it to the idea of spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency, which is where I'm kind of focused because of my own background, we, we any of us who've been through that kind of transformative experience know for sure, yes, we've been transformed. We can, we can kind of talk about maybe many ways that we've been transformed by that. But then I want to ask, does that transformative process that we experience on a personal level impact how we relate or how we engage with the external world? And if it does, yeah. if it does, how does it? How does it impact our, our engagement with the outer world? So this study is focused on engagement in the, with the outer world in activities toward sustainability, so toward things that would uh, address some kind of some one or may, more than of the social kinds of issues that we have, whatever that might be, it might be injustice, it might be wars, it might be ecological uh, degradation, it might be financial inequity, it might be a justice system that doesn't work right, all kinds of ways, all kinds of places that. Um, we have problems in our culture that need us, you know, need to be addressed in some different ways. So it sounds like you had this hypothesis that if people have these spiritually transformative experiences, they're going to go out there and be social justice warriors in a good sense, <laughs> it, like creating, you know, fighting for better a better world. Actually, I... I didn't have that hypothesis, and it, it's kind of funny. It kind of no. came exactly opposite from that. The impetus for this study you, you, came from my supervisor because you do graduate, you know, you do a dissertation. You have a supervisor. My supervisor is very, very focused on social change, and and so she said, "Well, here, you know, here are a few papers to read about social change because that was never an area that I really focused on. I'm on, I'm focused on healthcare and wellness and." you know, evolution of consciousness. She says, so she gives okay. me a couple of these research papers to read. And one of the research papers was, um, and they're very well written, but it's people who are working on these big social issues from a high level, 
trying to, you know, create what they call systems change. There's this whole science of right. systems change, which I knew nothing about either. So you have these people who are engaged in systems change for all kinds of things, the climate, finances, energy, transportation, education, blah, 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 all these kinds of topics. And the which isn't your thing. It, it, I just had no, like it was, it's you're... another one of those areas of life that I had just never explored. Systems change. What, okay. I'm not sure what that means. You know, how do you do that? What, what does it entail? Mm -hmm. But the point of this paper was that they were saying, we've been at this for decades, 30, 40, 50 years of trying to do systems change. And our systems are, are the problems that we want to address just use a call, you just use environmental degradation for one example are getting worse they're not getting better we're not we're not addressing the problems we're not making an impact with our systems change mm -hmm. and we've analyzed it which you know linear processes are very good at analyzing things and we have discovered that <laughs> and it sounds so I, I'm not I I very much respect the researchers so I'm not making fun of their conclusion at all but they had, you know, they've created these graphs and these diagrams and right at the center of it says, well, here's the individual person and we want to be able to impact, we want to be able to motivate this individual person to engage in all these systems change uh, mechanisms that we've set up and we can't figure out why we can't get them to engage. And we know it has something to do with their values and their worldview and they had a couple of other kind of buzzword terms in there. And then when I read it, because I'm coming from exactly the other perspective, which is personally transformative experiences impact exactly that, our values, our worldview, our perspectives. That's what happens in a transformative mm -hmm. experience. I looked at things in one way before the experience, and after the experience, I saw things differently. And what I understood from reading this systems change information was that they were trying to figure out how to impact or how to generate that change. And when I read it, I said, I know where that change comes from, mm -hmm. or at least I know where some of it comes from. Not that, not that spiritual emergence is the answer to everything, but I was trying to find a point for research. And I was like, this is what I know about changes in worldview and values and perspectives. And this is what I'm reading that you don't understand about changes in worldview and perspectives. And, and so let me just see if it's possible that we can make any kind of connection between personal transformation and engagement with social change. Right. And that's where your work, I, you haven't seen my videos. I know you found my website, but half of my videos are on personal transformation, like um, entering into non-ordinary mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. right? And then the other half of the videos are about, uh, through basically spiral dynamics and Ken Wilber's vision, the evolution of consciousness in stages. So you've got, you're, and you're talking about how do state experiences impact stage mm -hmm. development. And that's been part of, I think, the history of psycho transpersonal psychology from the beginning, um, except it was all just kind of meshed together. They didn't realize what they were kind of doing. Well, the there's beginning. a lot of, and, and there's a lot of yeah. theories about consciousness development in, in transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's mm -hmm. 15 mm -hmm. or 20 of them anyway, I think, that I can think of. That's a lot. Uh, yeah. And different lines of development. Well, the lines are, are Ken Wilber's idea, right? No, but the, the lines are based on different yes. thinkers, yes. right? In a graph, yes. Um, Gene Gepser and Lovinger, Maslow, and, and a whole bunch of others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a, quite yeah. a few of them, uh, mm -hmm. and and because I'm so interested in the evolution of consciousness, uh, I also have a favorite person that I study for the evolution of consciousness. But it's not Ken Wilber; it's uh, a woman, who I, <laughs> yeah. a woman by the name of um, Jenny Wade, who is a transpersonal psychologist, and she works in California at uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. So if you could tell us a little bit about how Jenny Wade's 
theory of evolution of consciousness differs from what I've learned about from Ken Wilber. So Ken Wilber uh, has a pretty comprehensive theory of the evolution of consciousness. He starts with birth, when we're born, when we come into this life, and he traces through all of the normal uh, developmental stages that Piaget documented and researched and every other psychologist uses uh, all the way through, except that Ken Wilber, once people come into what is called kind of the adult stage of development, meaning that, okay, we've, you know, we're functional in our, in, in operating in the, in the world, that there are further uh, stages of development, according to Ken Wilber, moving toward what he calls unity consciousness. So that's a growth in consciousness, it's personal growth, it's awareness of a larger reality than kind of just what we think about in our ordinary reality lifetimes. You know, what can I, what can I see? What's around me? What can I touch? What do I have to do today? All of those kinds of routine things. And Ken Wilber comes along, not that he's the only one, but he comes along and says, well, there's, there's more to life than that, right? There's more going on. Ken Wilber has kind of laid out his whole timeline of the development of consciousness has clearly delineated two or three stages of development beyond that what's kind of what many times is called the achiever stage of of consciousness uh, or development, which is that we get to that professionally capable place in our lives and we can support ourselves and we're in relationship and we're doing all those things we thought we were supposed to do. That's kind of what's called the achiever stage. And for many, many of us, that is where we always thought we were headed to. That's where I'm Mm -hmm. trying to get to. And what Wilbur's saying is, yeah, okay, but you know what? There's something beyond that. Actually, a couple of two or three somethings beyond that as far as stages of further growth and development towards this idea of unification with something that's larger than us. Like the Godhead. Right. Something like that. Situation. Okay. So... Mm-hmm. Wilbur, of all the developmental psychology theories, uh, with the exception of Jenny Wade, has one of the most complete uh, explanations. Okay. And has probably devoted the most millions of words to all of those theories. <laughs> yes, and with continual upgrades right. and, and incorporating like 80 different thinkers and traditions and cultures and model of development. Right. The theory of yeah. everything, right? Theory of Everything. Right. That was my first book, <laughs> and I was just blown away. I was like, "Wow, this guy's got—he's got a lot of time on his hands, and I don't think he's got a girlfriend." <laughs> well, Jenny Wade, as much of that as Ken Wilber has laid out, Jenny Wade's explanation or diagramming of the development or the evolution of consciousness is actually even a little bit more comprehensive. So she doesn't begin at birth, like all almost all of the rest of the transpersonalists do. Stan Groff is the exception to that. Stan Groff gives Mm -hmm. some reflections, not some, quite a few reflections around the perinatal matrices, which is that Mm -hmm. prenatal and perinatal time of birth experiences that happen. So Jenny Wade says, like Groff, consciousness begins before birth, begins prenatally. And she times it actually, uh, I'm not sure Groff actually puts a pin into it. Jenny Wade puts a pin into it at the moment of conception. Okay. And so she's saying at the moment of conception, and what happens there is there is this alignment or this connection with what she calls a transcendent aspect of consciousness. And that Mm -hmm. transcendent aspect of consciousness is now part of this developing life form, part of this human being that's growing through the whole fetal stage that is born, is an infant, is a child, this type of thing. As the physical form starts to develop, the baby grows into a toddler, grows into a young child. There's all kinds of, of course, neurological development that's going on. The brain is developing, the neurological systems are developing, and all of that is is creating another level or a layer of consciousness that she calls the awareness consciousness. So this is a this awareness consciousness is attached to the physical form or is generated through the physical body. So we come through life, according to Jenny Wade's theory, with these two aspects of consciousness with us all the time, the transcendent piece and the awareness piece, the physical, physically connected awareness piece of consciousness. 
we go all the way through life. She has advanced stages, um, not named exactly the same as Ken Wilber's at all, but very easy to understand when she writes it out. And then you get to the end of life when the physical form dies, the physical body dies, the transcendent consciousness continues. And so that lays that groundwork for the theories of reincarnation, where we're seeing that the actual evolution of consciousness is not something that happens over the course of one human lifetime, that it's part of this larger cycle. It's part of this spiral of growth and development. Right. And this added part of consciousness that she's talking about, the transcendent consciousness, transcendent, you said? Transcendent, yep. And is that the part that sort of guides our life, like that the sort of takes us into the particular experiences or things that we want to accomplish while we're alive? That transcendent piece would be the piece that if we, when we talk about, well, I had some inner voice that said this to me or guided me like this, or I checked in and this is where, you know, I was, my intuition led me to, or we enter an altered state, however we enter the altered state, uh, and we make a connection with this transcendent consciousness, which is always there. We're just not present. Mm -hmm. We're just not aware of it or we're not connected with it. We've got, a, we've got our screening and our boundaries and those types of things. But when we go through a spiritual emergence or a spiritual emergency or any kind of anomalous or what Rhea White would call an extraordinary human experience, we are making connection. We're making contact with that transcendent part of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can even remember being in the psychiatric hospital and I'm and I thought I was dead. I'm I'm shackled to a bed. I thought I was dead. And I was just thinking, but I had more work to do. I had more work to do. I mean, what's more transcendent consciousness than thinking you've got more work to do while you're dead? <laughs> you know, I was regretting not being alive anymore. And then I found out I was alive and was kind of relieved. It's like, okay, I can get back to this work, whatever it is I'm supposed to be. And, and in the end of that comes this work, BipolarAwakenings.com is, is my life mission. Is, is to do this kind of work and try and keep a roof over my head at the same time. Yeah. You know. And this work that you're yeah. doing is so important because our culture doesn't acknowledge these kinds of experiences or doesn't acknowledge them as being a part of our normal growth and development and evolution. Mm -hmm, and, not at all. Right. And so it's very, it's very important what you're doing as far as offering a, you know, a space where people can learn and listen and speak with one another and communicate, understand they're not by themselves. It's, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. And it's part of what I kind of refer to as the normalization of spiritual emergence, which we sorely need to be doing in our culture. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was part of the whole intention was to get right. people talking about these things. Right. And um, when I told my story in 2007 on YouTube, talking about peeing on the floor in a hotel ballroom, it was a shock for people online because no one had ever gone public with a story like that. And we, we and the YouTube technology had just become available, you know. So prior to 2007, there wasn't a whole lot of video on, on the Internet. And then all of a sudden, I'm just out there. And, and I was pretty much the first one, you know, you can find videos of me with a lot more hair <laughs> from 2007. And I, and I'm proud to say that, you know, and, and part of my transcendent spirit was I always wanted to be first at something. Like I wanted to be on the leading edge of something. I didn't know what it was. And I always wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know I'd be dealing with this, which was, it's much more challenging than yeah. what I thought I was sort of going to be leaning into. Yeah, say. sometimes we're not yeah. given a choice of what we're here no. to do. You want a spiritual calling? Well, here it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Help me. <laughs> yeah. And so um, do you want to get back to let's talk about your research and so where do we go from there? I, I think probably an easy place to start. Actually, that discussion about Jenny Wade's uh, theory of consciousness is a good place to start because the researcher who initially really kind of captured my uh, imagination when I started my studies at Aleph Trust 
was this woman by the name of Rhea White. I mentioned her right at the beginning, but she was a parapsychologist researcher in the late 50s and early 60s into the 70s, 80s. Uh, but she did uh, something interesting with her research because she said there are these anomalous, for lack of a better term, experiences that people have. It could be a psychic experience. It could be an ET encounter. It could be an alien kind of uh, visitation. It could be, you know, uh, these external spirit visitations. It could be a near-death experience. It could be, there's all kinds of things that happen to people, and they were all being studied at that time, and still kind of tends to be that way, in individual kind of silos of academia. Right. So we have the parapsychology silo, which only has to do, silo. and we have the near-death silo, and we have the spiritual emergency silo, and this type of thing. Well, Rhea White's sense was, I'm, I want to look at all of these as a phenomena or a collection of phenomena, not separated by how this thing is happening, but what actually is this thing that's happening when somebody has an unusual experience. And so she did a very thorough, years of really thorough research, thousands of people. She asked them about their experiences and asked them a whole bunch of questions about what they felt, what they saw, all this kind of thing, gathering their experience. And she cataloged all of this and she actually developed, I don't know, almost 200 different names of experiences that people wow. had. And then she looked at them all and analyzed them all. And she said, well, what's the commonality? of all of these kind of unusual experiences. And it was this transformative element that was the common um, piece, that somebody has something unusual happen to them, and then they are, after a, after a whole lot of stuff in the middle, transformed. And then she went ahead and actually broke down the process about having an unusual experience, not knowing what to think about it, depending on how um, reluctant we are to acknowledge that experience, for many people, it's just pushed aside. It's denied. Bria White said that the common element in all of these types of experiences was this transformation that happened on the, on the personal level, on the individual level. But that, and then, she, and then she dissected the experience. And the very first part of it was that if something unusual happens, and we feel very uncomfortable about it, and we're just going to do that thing about pushing it away, like mm -hmm. I did with my own experience. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Right? It's uncomfortable. I don't want to think about it. And so we, if we do that with an unusual experience, and we push it aside, and we just deny it, or we say, oh, I mu it must have been my imagination, and it, you know, blah, 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 and we just kind of reject it, then we've basically um, derailed the opportunity for transformation with that particular experience, right? right? Because we haven't allowed ourselves to go into it. If the person says, wow, that was really weird, and I don't know what to think about that, and I don't know how to think about that, and that's where that cognitive dissonance comes in, like, what the heck? I thought it was like this, and then this thing happened to me, and now I think it's like this, but how can that be? Because nobody else thinks it's like that. And the world doesn't talk about it like that. And everybody's going to think I'm crazy, et cetera, et cetera, that whole process. If the person can tolerate that level of cognitive dissonance and say, all right, well, let me, let's, you know, in, instead of turning away from it, let me turn into it. Right. And see what the heck this is about. Then we talked about going through, but then the experience which is this i think this connection with that transcendent level of consciousness that transcendent element of consciousness that something that's larger than we are that connection that's happened for us we are going to allow that to work on us and through us and with us and that becomes that process of transformation that we don't know where it will take us. We're not sure how long it will last. And that we have to kind of just bear with it sometimes as we're working through it. Keep our physical plant strong enough to support that transformation that's happening. And Rhea White, as she was writing all of this out, and kind of, it's kind of the recipe for how to process an unusual experience. And she put, she gave each stage a name. 
So there would be, you know, a, just an experience and then there would be an extraordinary experience. That's if you accept that you've had some unusual thing. And then if you allow yourself, her language, if you allow yourself to be transformed by that experience, then it becomes what she called an extraordinary human experience or an EHE. Her viewpoint of EHEs was she agreed that this was a connection with something larger than ourselves and that that experience held the seeds for personal evolution and for cultural and societal evolution. Okay. But now this gets back to what I said, that I thought you were hypothesizing that, that having powerful spiritual transformative experience would lead to wanting to engage in social action for global trans, uh, transformation. But you, you said you disagreed with I me. I did disagree you with did, you. You didn't think that way. I didn't. Why, why did, I didn't think that way. You didn't. I didn't. I accept, and now? I accept, well, because I told you about the systems change kind of perspective that right. came in. Right. I accept, I, it made complete sense to me, all of what Rhea White was writing made complete sense to me that this was mm -hmm. a seed. These were the seeds for evolution on a personal level. Right. My conception about the evolution of consciousness basically never was anything beyond my own evolution of consciousness until I started consciousness studies. It never occurred to mm. me, like, how what happens beyond my own growth process. Yes, I have a responsibility for my own growth process. Then what? I never had a, I never gave it a lot of thought. <clears throat> the white is saying, you know, here's, here are the seeds of, or she calls it actually cultural amplification. So she says, if you're talking about your experience with others, if you, if you don't just hold it inside or push it away, if you allow yourself to be transformed and then you share your experience with other people, what you're doing is amplifying that experience, that, that connection with that transcendent source mm. and, and weaving it in or injecting it into the cultural mix. In other words, the, the influences that are what drives our culture. In other words, simply having this podcast is a means for social change because talking about it amplifies Exactly. It. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, I, I hadn't thought about it that way a whole lot, but, you know, I'm on a trip, trip up here to, to Toronto, my hometown, and I've met with a few sort of activists in this area of the spiritual uh, dimension of mental disorders, this kind of thing. And in both conversations with, with two different women, I started coughing spontaneously, like hacking away in a way that was really interrupting my, my conversation. And it, it just hit me that my throat chakra was just like, speak, Sean, get it out there, like you know, to a broader audience, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe there's a sense of urgency at this point, too, because along with the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of society, I think everybody can agree that we're in a period right now of devolution, right. of de-civilization. There's a lot of activity happening that is extremely disturbing. Yeah. People jumping out of airplanes that are taking off, stores needing to close because of theft. Yeah. Like that's unheard of in previous uh, decades. Yeah. And all this, like in and out Burger in Oakland needs to close because they were getting robbed 10 times a day. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. it's insane yeah. what you, when you think about that. And so it's like, it seems that there's this devolutionary thing happening, particularly in the United States, extreme political thinking, you know? Yes. And, and from what I've seen being back home, Canada is not too far behind, right. you know? Right. It's just maybe five years behind the whole thing. Brazil's not a whole lot different. Um, maybe a, a little bit better, but it's, it's still politically very extreme. Right. You know, so all of this stuff needs to, we need to get through this to a certain degree. Well, and I, and, and maybe yep. we need to talk, you know. Exactly. And I think that that's a, that's a piece that's really important. And so that's part of what uh, I'm doing with my research is asking people who have had transformative experiences. And this is part of the, you know, what moved me to connect with you. 
people who have had transformative experiences, I'm gathering information, I'm gathering data from people who will participate, who will offer their expertise on how it was that you managed your integration process, that accommodation process of those big changes that happened after your transformative experience. There was a piece of research that was done by a woman named Marie Grace Brooke in 2016. Right. And this is how we got in touch because my wife, Leisha, was in touch with Marie Grace Brooke. Yep. And I guess they got, she got you in touch with us yes. somehow. So Marie Grace Brooke's original PhD research was around <clears throat> trying to identify what techniques actually people used and found helpful in that process of recovering or, or kind of reorienting after a transformative experience, a disruptive, you know, not a, not like mm -hmm. a, a blissful transformative experience where somebody wakes up the next morning and they're just like, this is great, but a, a, more, tr a more challenging kind of a transformation. And so Marie Grace Brooke put together, she talked to a number of experts who at that time were dealing with supporting people through uh, emergency, spiritual emergency, and gathered up all of their recommendations for practices that would be helpful and created this survey and based her PhD research on the data that she gathered. That survey has been done once, which was the 2015-16 with Marie Grace. It's been written up. It's been published by the American Psychological Association's one of the publications. So it's mm. in this research stream. And when I, I became aware of it uh, a couple of years ago, I was pretty excited because a lot of the research papers that I read in transpersonal psychology are theoretical. Sure. Uh, and this is not. This is pragmatic. This is okay. useful, helpful, practical <laughs> information. And I got all excited about it. And I got in touch with Marie Grace. And, and then I said, well, why is it? I was volunteering, I still am, with the Spiritual Crisis Network in the UK at the time. And I said, why is it we don't have a list of these top 10 or top 12 practices that you have documented in your study? Why, why isn't everybody aware of these practices that are helpful and you know it, why isn't it common knowledge and she said well um, like everything in science it has to be repeated it has to be replicated to be validated I said okay so when it came time for me to put together my dissertation research i knew that i wanted to somehow do something that was related to that uh research that marie grace had done so that okay. piece that she has, uh, that she did, that survey is the piece that I'm using as the opening data gathering for my process of research. So I'm looking for people who have had transformative experiences, who are willing to contribute their expertise by doing this survey, reviewing this survey and saying, okay, practice number one, whatever it might be. No, I didn't do that. Two, I did that. It didn't really help me very much. Three, yeah, I did that. It was sort of all right. Here's what I did. Yeah, that was really helpful, et cetera, et cetera. There's about 80, a little more than 80 practices in that survey. All of that information gets, you know, processed through the statistical significance, you know, statistical analysis. And if it um, supports Marie Grace's original research, then that information is considered by the scientific community to be valid and it will allow okay. broader distribution of that. So it becomes part of the common resources for our mental health organizations and our first responders and our psychology communities. And, you know, a whole, there's a whole herd of people that would have access to that valid information. Wow. So it can have it sounds like you're not just interested in doing this research for research sake or general curiosity, but you're looking to implement systems change through this research on systems change. <laughs> well, I didn't I never thought yeah. about it that way, but that's an interesting way to say it. Okay. I'm looking to yeah. um, help. I wanted to, I wanted my research to not be just something that sat on a shelf somewhere or that ticked the box. Yes, you did it. You wrote a dissertation. And I, I asked early on, you know, how can I do something that would be practical? Like, can somebody steer me in a direction that would be practical? And at the master's level, everybody just kind of, uh, everybody being, meaning professors or, you know, advisors just kind of said, that's not what master's work is about. 
That's PhD and stuff. I, I'm like, I'm not yeah. there. I'm not at the PhD level. I'm at the master's level. What can I do that would be practical and helpful? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've seen those theses, man, uh, at one school down here, just stacks of these theses, theses that, you know, all these students spend two, three years on and nobody reads them, right. just their professor and that's it. And for me, it's like, what a waste of time, like on my side, like yep. personally, I'm sure it's important for them. But man, for me to spend three years working on something that nobody's going to read except my my uh, professor, I mean, but see, you got to it, get get it out there. You know, right. you want to get things but out. But see, there. you can make of it if you self if you're self directed. I mean, there is a there is some allowance for self direction, and so I am. You know, I have been able to kind of say this is what I want to do, mm -hmm. and then you know I had to kind of fit it into the parameters, of course, of the program that I'm in. So what it turns out is that I'm doing a pretty sizable piece of research in a fairly confined amount of time. So <laughs> when's your due date? Well, the the dissertation, the full dissertation finished has to be in by early July, which seems early like July. a long way out, but No, it's not a lot it's of time. Not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're gonna make it. <laughs> uh I I am pretty determined that I will make it. You're determined? Well, <laughs> you, you seem like an organized person. So if anybody can do it, it's you. Well, but, but see, this is this, daunting. So, so this piece, this survey piece is really just the, is phase one of my project. So the survey is phase one and I need to get enough people who are, who are willing to contribute their expertise so that we get a statistically significant sample. We get enough people that you can say, okay, I'm looking at your results and your results are valid because you have enough people that have provided that information. And then mm -hmm. phase two where moves on and asks people who have taken the survey. The survey can be taken anonymously, completely. Um, but for people who may have an interest in participating in the second phase, they can provide a name and an email for further contact. And at that point, then I'm going to be asking, or I am asking to people that are moving into phase two about how they see, or do they see a relationship between this idea of what's happening with me personally and how I'm, how I am engaging in the outer world. Okay. Because terrific, I don't terrific. have a thesis about that. I don't have a theory about that. Hypothesis. 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 You don't have a hypothesis. I don't have a hypothesis. Okay. I don't believe you, but okay. I believe you. <laughs> I, I have my own I know beliefs. you believe that. <laughs> I know you believe that. <laughs> it's very funny because I just finished watching the movie Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer? Mm -hmm. And the whole movie, people around this guy who made the atom bomb were just very curious about what his motivations were for doing what he was doing, you know? Yeah. And then they really press him at the end of the movie, like, why are you doing this, you know? To save humanity or to destroy it, in, in a sense, you know? Yeah. Um. Well, listen, we should wrap up, yes. though. I think this is a good place to wrap up. And because it's so important to get this research done and, and for you to get a robust sample size, um, can you give me a link that I can put right on the video? And I'll just leave it up on the video as much as possible. And then in the description box below on YouTube, I'll provide live links. Um, and on this will go up on Spotify as well. And I'll and I'll. Everywhere there's a description box, I'll put up the links Super. and we'll put, up, put it up on Facebook, put it on the Facebook group Shades of Awakening and sort of, you know, twist some people's arms to say, come on, Elizabeth needs a little bit of help here. Because a lot of people in the bipolar awakenings community, they want to want to change the world, you know, they want to help society, you know, Um and and so you know this is this is part of it. There's a great need for social justice, social change, um, that comes through in, in these moments. You know. Well, and I think you know you said it a few minutes ago, a little bit earlier, where you said, "Well, I guess what I'm doing, what you're doing with your broadcast, with your organization, with your communication, is social change." Yes, it is. Even mm -hmm. though you might not necessarily have thought about it that way in the past. There well, are. I've thought about it. There are a lot of ways of impact of generating social change other than the kind of the big ones that we think about, like, well, how am I going to deal with environmental degradation or how am I going to deal with, you know, 
political injustice or those kinds of things. There are lots of other aspects of social change, and this is a very important sure. one. Well, then my, my work is about deep healing. Yeah. You know, that's one part of it, too. And to me, if you heal one person, then you're healing that family. Yes. And if you're healing that family, you're healing the community, and there's a ripple effect. Exactly. You know? And, and those people get interested in doing, um, like they become therapists, like Monica Kettler, one of my clients, is now a therapist. Tim Canote is working in a psychiatric hospital. They want to do good things. They want to make the world a better place. Yep. So I've seen it really directly um, that, it, that it can happen, you know. So, well, this has been great. It's been lovely speaking with you, Elizabeth. Thank you for joining me. And maybe you come back once your research is done. I'd be curious to see. What you have to say then? Well, I I would love to. Uh, I was thinking about whether I could even give you some early information, but I actually can't because I don't quite have enough of a handle yet on what's happening um, okay. to even speculate on it. But I want to thank you so much for your time and your invitation. I really appreciate it. And it's really been enjoyable to speak with you. Okay, thanks. I enjoyed it as well. It's been very interesting and a different spin. You know, you're doing something quite original out there. And I have a lot of respect for people uh, like yourself who are trying to do research on this topic in a very polished university level way, because I know how challenging it is. It's not easy territory. Right. So. And part of it is this, this reluctance of the, of the experience or community to be seen or to be heard by kind of the authorities. And we need to be seen and heard. We need to be able to have a venue where we're putting forward our own experience because experience is the valuable piece. People can theorize. Ken Wilbur, Jenny Wade, they can theorize all day long, and a lot of that is also valuable, but we need the actual experiential data, and we need, so that means it only comes from those of us that are willing to come forward and contribute and talk about what, we've, what we're going through, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> I'll say thanks and I'll sign off. Stay on the call. Okay. And I'll Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.